So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Soren and let Soren uh, begin and start the chat. Um, with 15 years of experience in landscape design, backed by award-winning portfolio projects ranging from private residential to state land to planning, Soren is an expert in home site stewardship. He is the mastermind of landscaping of many bright built and Kaplan and Thompson homes, blending his creativity with artistry deeply rooted in the commitment to sustainability. So uh, welcome, Soren, if you want to jump in. Yeah, thanks, Jay, for the introduction. Um, I'm not sure if I'm on video or not, but I'm happy to start. Hit start video. All right, let me go here. I think it's, it's frozen there. Um, maybe I have to um, give permission to the host to um, start it. But. Uh, I'll just keep talking if they can see me great. Um, if not, um, right. Uh, well, thank you all for your interest. Um, and, you know, this sort of discussion today was hope hopefully going to consider all the topics related to uh, landscape and site um, development related to, um, you know, existing bright built home houses, as well as sort of the planning and thinking in advance of uh, purchasing or considering um, a bright built home. Uh, the way I like to consider uh, the field of landscape architecture is, is sort of phonetically um, land, which is sort of the macro, um, bigger thinking, regional context, how the, um, the house fits into the bigger um, ecosystem and and uh, watershed and then um, scape, which might be more aesthetically streetscape or neighborhood, residential neighborhood. And then the architecture is how all the pieces come together, even the house being situated in the broader landscape. I'm not sure architects always sort of push back on that, but it's, uh, I like to, to see it as a, a, a sort of a larger uh, network, um, especially on the planning purposes. But um, so my background is in art and uh, land use policy and agriculture. And I found the profession of landscape architecture as a sort of an overlay of these two interests that really combines my interest in creativity, but also the practical sort of um, baseline of sustainability and land use policy and, and, and how to really live on the land. So um, it's an incredibly broad field and um, it's really fun to to practice um, and to dialogue and get to get to know homeowners who want to, um, you know, have ideals about living in the landscape and having their house in a landscape and, and then having, you know, helping guide the best way to overlay the space making with budget. And those are sort of the, the sweet spot of, of um, figuring out what's practical and maybe one of the best value added things of working with a landscape architect is to really um, help plan and think about the costs associated with land use design and, and, um, and, um, and then implementation. So even if you're not able to necessarily accomplish everything in phase one, having a master plan. So every, everything's uh, sort of considered holistically from the get go, um, including you grading. Do you time to get your video working so we can see you and possibly share any images you might have for the presentation? Um, I, yeah, I've been clicking away a little bit here and I've been still been getting the, um, the post that it's, uh, the host has stopped, uh, my sharing screen. If there's maybe a release that you guys can click. Perhaps if you share your screen and just put an image up and it'll pull in for you. Sure. I'll try screen share. <clears throat> Uh, right now, I just have the Bright Built um, website up, so we can start to maybe consider different, um, you know, what I thought would be maybe topical or interesting is to think about, you know, all the different model homes and to, to consider uh, the <clears throat> different ways that I would approach or consider designing for each one. Um, it's really uh, unique and and off, you know, specific to each each uh, homeowner's ask or need in terms of what the uh, outdoor programming spaces are. But there's some essential things that are um, important to kind of get right from the get-go, which is one, the siting of the house, and some of that's dictated really 
you know, pre predictated by solar patterns um, and prevailing winds and things that it would consider for the, the general massing itself. But uh, grading is certainly one of them. Um, a lot of the site work that's um, done correctly in the beginning can save a lot of headache uh, down the road. And so, um, especially for the the units like the Vinyl Haven or others that have potential uh, split level access and making sure that those grade transitions from the front door in and around feel um, appropriate, you know, whether they're retaining or natural graded sloping. So um, some, some of the important things too um, is to, you know, I think when homeowners go into purchasing a, a bright belt or even a, any kind of home is to, to kind of be focused on all the costs associated with, with the build um, from the, the purchase and sale all the way through. Um, but it the, the house tends to take up a lot of the focus. So one um, thing I'd like to, you know, impart is to try to encourage earmarking a, at least, you know, a sizable percentage for the landscape so that it doesn't necessarily feel um, just dropped into the site and in a ratio that sometimes uh, seems to work is roughly 10% of the cost of the, the build, the house build, um, to make it feel sort of um, aesthetically and qualitatively appropriate to, to the house, to get you at least a, a nice walkway and uh, an auto quarter driveway um, and decent plantings, um, and even maybe some site lighting to consider. Um, uh, one of the reasons why I, I love working with Bright Built and another like-minded creatives that are really um, focused on resilience and sustainability in the build community is that, you know, there's um, just a nice overlay of values. And I think, um, you know, trying to figure out how, I think, you know, the quantitative aspect of the bright built um, savings and, and energy savings is all very um, tangible because it can be broken down in the landscape. It's, it's a little bit um, gray as far as inputs, energy inputs and cost returns and those sort of things. So um, it, it's really case by case basis, but if you're considering um, a maintenance strategy, for example, mowing, those things you can quantify uh, how far materials are coming from, are they locally harvested stone versus, you know, um, a recycled product, um, water usage. There, there are some metrics that can be applied um, and, and are often quantified in different types of passive house and uh, lead certified um, sort of point systems. But um, I think just sort of applying a common sense um, approach is, is something that we'd like to um, work with each, each homeowner, try and identify what are the outdoor spaces you're trying to achieve? What are the best materials? And, and since we have these sort of live numbers and live reference points in our head, those are how we are able to sort of give feedback and, and create, start a design process that really is a sort of custom and, and suited to each individual um, and, and its unique setting. So um, <clears throat> I think that, Jay, that's sort of just sort of a baseline um, introduction to, you know, how we're thinking about um, our collaboration. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to sort of, if you have any questions that want to prompt as a springboard to, to move, move, uh, move the discussion, I'm happy to. Certainly, I think a lot of sort of as a Q&A &A with a you. A few of the questions yeah. that folks sent in prior to the webinar. Yeah, great. Yes, hi, this is Audrey. Um, I'm sorry, I can't share my video right now for some reason, but um, I can. Uh, we did get a few uh, questions uh, during uh, registration. The first is which of which is um, this person is interested in stormwater management and especially nitrogen absorbing plant recommendations to protect wetlands from runoff. Well, that is an interesting question. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Very um, poignant and um, stormwater management is um, I don't know if any of you live in the Northeast, but we've had some, some great um, rains this past month, I think one of the wettest July's on record. Um, and uh, 
planning for stormwater is, is really important. So water catchment um, is uh, to have a, a strategy around that from, from the beginning is pretty uh, important, whether it's um, infiltrated, you know, and diffused back down into the groundwater if, or if it's point source and channeled. Um, it sounds like the question may be more related to specific plant types that capture nitrogen. And um, I think, you know, there's a sort of a strategy. There's two, two ways to do it. One, you want to slow the rate of water down, sort of the, the coefficient of, of diffusing the water before it gets to the wetland so that it's a slower release and that the plants have a chance to absorb the, the nutrients, phosphorus, phosphorus and nitrogen before it gets into the wetland. Um, the, and so essentially you would, the idea would be to create a planted buffer before it gets there. Um, there, are, there are some plants um, that take up nitrogen more quickly, but it's also uh, bacteria and other things that can eat the nitrogen and sort, sort of convert the solid state nitrogen into a, into a gas. And so it goes into the atmosphere versus into the water. And um, you don't want to plant legumes because legumes actually are the, the plants that fix nitrogen from the air, not from water or soil. So um, I think that most, most green vegetation that are non-legume plants um, can, can draw nitrogen from, from water and, and the soil. So the idea is to stop it, slow it, let it infiltrate, and then let the, the plants do their work. And I think um, suitable plants are, there's, um, you know, switch grasses for one uh, are really good at sort of uh, with a dense root structure and um, stems can slow the water down before uh, entering and creating a swath. And this actually is a, a project that uh, on the screen now that we worked on that had a large grass and mass planting where we use grasses strategically that kind of around infiltration um, and stormwater channeling to and these plants are drought tolerant as well as um, can take wet feet. So it's a uh, switchgrass is a great northeast native plant that can sort of work worse and, and help. Um, you know, the byproduct is to uh, if it's picking up any heavy metals and that sort of thing is to, you know, it can be harvested and, and disposed of appropriately. So um, I hope that answers the question. Um, I'm happy to have a follow up uh, with any of these questions as a sidebar. You can email me directly or, you know, we can have an addendum conversation. Yeah, so excuse me, if any, um, if anyone wants to add questions, you're welcome to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to add some questions. Otherwise, um, I will uh, continue on. Um, let's see, one participant has um, a wooded site and not is not planning on a grass lawn. Um, so how would that affect um, your design with a bright built uh, solar gain maybe in mind? Um, that's, that's a really perfect question. That is a, um, a pretty common um, condition where we need the clearing to get the solar gains to, you know, passive house, uh, you know, passive solar or, you know, the solar panel array. Um, and that sometimes is up to 100 foot clearing, depending on how the tall the trees are. So that implies, you know, disturbing an area of, of land that's fairly large. So to re revegetate that with a non lawn surface um, can get quite expensive if it's not a grass itself. So we have been promoting custom blended uh, meadow mixes. Um, we also use um, blended mixes from New England wetland plants based in Hadley, Mass. They have great resources of seed mixes that are um, site-specific blending that can add a uh, different ecological or wildlife aspect and even, you know, wild flower color if that's an interest of yours. So I, I think the, the meadow is really an appropriate choice it's a little bit challenging to get established, uh, you know, the timing of it, uh, making sure that germination times are, are that it's installed usually when cool season grasses can germinate. So earlier summer, late spring or early fall so that um, you're hitting those windows and you're not having to compete as much with um, invasive grasses like uh, um, you know, different crab grass and that sort of thing. But um, there's certainly a, Alternatives, depending on what your budget is, you can look to establish other native 
ground cover plantings. Hay scented fern is a really beautiful plant that has a spreading quality and can take full sun. Um, same with low bush blueberry. And both those are kind of byproducts of, um, well, blueberry being of the blueberry industry here in Maine, they, can, they actually cut uh, edges of the, the barrens um, as sod. And it's, uh, you know, basically delivered to the site as a two by two square and, and put down in place. Um, and there is some weeding uh, involved with that in the first year or two until it really establishes. And then also hasten it fern is cut out of the um, power lines essentially as a maintenance um, strategy. And, and that spreads prolifically and um, gives a, a pretty interesting um, fall color and lush green. It doesn't have any real winter interest, but um, those are sort of the three uh, go-to plants that I would use for sort of fast spreading non-lawn approaches. Uh, there are some fescues um, that are like a low growth fescue that have almost the appearance of a lawn but don't have the mowing maintenance required. So Aaron, um, our, do you, you said a meadow mix, does that mean a seed mix or are you talking about actually planting? Yeah, uh, that's a great distinction. You can do both. Uh, I was thinking a seed mix to start to establish and hold soil and is really sort of the, the key before that all gets washed away. So getting a grass mix of um, native grasses and forbs to get established. And then if you have particular interest or it's the primary view shed from the house and you wanna add accent color or ephemeral blooms, you could certainly overseed it or plug plant with specific um, meadow plants, you know, um, Joe Pye weed and um, bee balm, if you wanted some bright pops of purple or even like in the spring when it's low, um, you can integrate some blue flag iris, which is a native uh, iris and it's all sort of custom, customized or personal dependent. Um, um, I'm seeing a question pop up about saying, would those same plants be okay over a septic system? And uh, yes, as long as they're um, sort of non-woody uh, perennial herbaceous plants, they would be fine over a septic system. Um, sometimes a septic system, depending on how much soil coverage you have on top, um, can get a little dry. So if there's opportunity for, you know, water catchment and rain barrel, barrel system or otherwise um, keep making sure that that's watered in. Um, but most of, most, of the, most of those plants are pretty drought tolerant plants that hay scented in blueberry specifically. Mm -hmm. And then um, obviously we wanna keep woody bushes and things like that from growing on top of the septic so they don't um, right. Right. bother the, the system. Right. Great. Um, Someone has a comment about rising costs and build out times. Um, what are you seeing in that? I don't think it's as, as steep as what I'm seeing in the house build industry or the, you know, the wood construction build industry in general, but um, there has been a little bit of uptick. Uh, the, the delays are um, more related to labor shortages and material shortages. So, um, all, all of my projects have stayed on track and on time. You know, the spring mostly just because I'm trying to wrangle everybody to, to keep it going. And um, a lot of these process, design pr processes have been in place for about a year anyway. But I'd say if there was a, a quicker need for a turnaround, I, I do sort of project a couple months at least for the delay. But uh, the cost, I would, I, maybe 10% higher than last year. It's not like the 30% I'm seeing in the, the house build industry, but um, see the only real products I've seen affected are like bluestone for availability and uh, cedar for if you're doing posts or edging or um, siding or fencing and that sort of thing. But uh, metal, stone, like granite, um, some of the permeable pavers are out because they're coming from Canada, but um, not, not huge delays. So I hope that helps. Mm, thank you. And actually, um, Elizabeth, thanks for your questions uh, from um, one of them is about uh, pervious paving systems that mm -hmm. will stand up to snow plowing um, yeah. and are budget friendly. So um, can you speak yeah. to that? Uh, yes, they 
I'm doing more and more of them. I think people are being, um, well, there's a couple of reasons. One, a lot of these homes are coastal homes and um, impervious surface calculations are quantified. So you know, we have a certain limit of impervious surface that's allowed. So the non-vegetated surfaces is how they really are categorizing them now versus impervious. Mm -hmm. you can't can't grow green on it um, or vegetation. Uh, they they um, require a little bit more maintenance, and I, it's a little more hand holding with whoever's maintaining it, whether it's being plowed or snow plowed. But I've had two projects installed since 2014 that have using these. Um, these are Hastings checker block pavers in this rendering, um, and they've held up really well. I'm surprising. It was almost done as a sort of a beta test to figure out if it was gonna, gonna fly when we were, would replace it if it wouldn't. And um, they they really like it and it's, it's held up and um, you know it, it gets daily usage, um, truck deliveries and um, snowplow. I would say that we've had to over seed shim any sort of settling or washouts at some point and then and put more seed into it. But um, as far as the products themselves, they get a little chipped and ding, but that's sort of the, the patina of any uh, driving surface that happens. Um, there's a spectrum of quality products as well as aesthetics. So these ones, you actually see the, the reveal of the, the concrete above the surface. And then there's a, there's a grid of them below grade, whereas there are also the geo cell products that are, are less visible. There's simply PVC um, plastic cells that get infilled with with soil um, matrix and then seeded over. Those are less expensive and perhaps a little less durable for everyday use. Um, although we've, we've um, been using them pretty frequently too. So um, the, it's, a, it's a, maybe a broader discussion than I can answer all the questions on that today, but I'm happy to, again to sort of talk through the pros and cons of your specific project if you wanna email me or, or mm. ping me offline. Yeah. Um, okay, and then there's um, a couple about uh, water steward stewardship. How can landscape design promote energy and water stewardship? And um, and then what can you do with a a, a pretty wet site? So mm. maybe they're opposite each other, but uh, both about water. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, Water, uh, I think, is really how I think about starting every project has to start with water. Um, I had a grading professor in college and it's, it's the university and he's like, uh, water always wins. So you have to plan for water to, to win <laughs> and to channel and, and uh, or work with it, I should say. Um, and uh, so watered stewardship, um, if you're in a drought, you know, condition, you know, tr to try to be as water um you know to conserve as much water as possible and so i think the, that speaks directly to the plant palette that is selected for the overall approach and the water needs that are required for the landscape um, i designed for projects that have full irrigation requirements and we do do uh, cistern and, and stormwater catchment um, quite often using low profile cisterns that you can tuck under a deck or ones that are actually built in ground and um, you know then they require a pump system to to pump the water back out and irrigate but uh, it's it's uh, not as high cost long term um, if you're interested in really thriving lush looking plants if you're interested in sort of a simulated natural ecosystem ecology that's adapted with native plants uh, basically your plant community will look similar to what it would look like if you're to walk through a native coastal meadow or a woodland whatever you're trying whatever um, you know plant community that we're trying to simulate those plants would um, endure the same way the, the, the conditions um, I, I love that approach uh, it's sort of a permaculture approach and you can integrate at a, you know um, edible plants into that with blueberries and beach plum and other um, trees and shrubs. Um, I'm not sure if that was part of the question, but I'm thinking about water demands for certain types of plants. Um, and you can create a really stunning, beautiful plant palette um, with a water conservation approach. Um, there was, was there a second part of that question, Audrey? Well, um, 
uh, it's, it's nice to hear about the conservation because of course bright pilt is is all about conservation right mm -hmm. um so thank you for pointing that out um yes uh another uh comment our site can be very wet and we thought about establishing some rain gardens however we've also seen the site when it becomes quite dry like mm -hmm. during last year's drought i'm wondering if rain gardens can survive extremes maybe you can talk about rain gardens what they are and, and um, if they can uh, yeah rain gardens are um, a great way to um, we were talking about sort of point source and infiltration is to collect stormwater channelize and collect stormwater and allow it to slowly infiltrate back into the groundwater system or you know eventually spill over have an overflow to another water source but um, slowing down the rate so it doesn't overwhelm existing um, bodies of water like streams or rivers um, or ponds. So <clears throat> a lot of that has to do with the how they're constructed and the um, soil types that, that are built into it. Um, you can create them almost like a dry well condition where you would excavate deep. Um, you know, you can go four to six feet deep and fill that with crushed stone. So there's almost like an empty reservoir below the surface that, that's the filter fabric sand and then a low mix on top of it and that's what you plant into but so when the water arrives at that point it has ability to perk down through and fill up that volume um, and uh it's interesting being wet and dry i know there's um you know the, it seems like uh it must have some some layer of mineral aspects that allows the water to really perk really well in that place but the plant communities are there's certainly plants that are adapted to it. I, I leaned on the switchgrass before, and that's another kind of go-to plant, but there's um, obviously other woody plants like um, Clethra on the bullia. They make some interesting hybrid varieties, but that's often called summer sweet. That's a pretty drought tolerant native plant that does really well in a rain garden environment. Um, red twig dogwood uh, can take wet feet. It can basically live in water, but also can be as a drought tolerant plant. And, I often use a dwarf variety called Kelsei that, um, you know, doesn't get quite as wild and rangy. Uh, it's a little bit easier to maintain. And they, as a garden aspect, you know, they, I think the notion that they can have some aesthetic beauty quality, so you can overlay all kinds of um, flowering grasses and um, perennials in, into that. And there's some hardier ones like uh, Agastache um, is a, plant that attracts all kinds as a pollinator garden plant that uh, takes wet and dry feet. So anyway, there's there are lists online and um, if you have a uh, specific um, sort of area or um, aesthetic qualities you'd like to explore, I'm happy to you know, provide a list of uh, rain garden plants that we use uh, frequently. Sounds very good. Um, another comment, as we plan a landscape that will include a lawn of some kind, as well as other plantings, do we need to plan for a watering system or can we live without it? Question. Um, yeah, it's really hard not knowing what yeah, the climate is gonna bring us here um, this summer you would have been fine without a watering system <laughs> so far. Feels like, I mean, there was an extreme heat weather week uh, early in the summer, but this rain has just been prolific um, and uh, kept everything really lush. So I think to safeguard your investment and approach in the lawn, um, most installers or people that would maintain that would recommend a watering system, at least to have it on hand. So in the event that you, you were going away or there was a drought, you have the ability to add water, but something that you can customize or tailor the um, usage so that um, it's a low draw system. It's not, it wouldn't have to be an everyday system. And a lot of installers, just as I'm not sure everybody's aware, but like, um, you know, warranty plants for up to a year once it's, it's planted. And it's a lot of times that warranty is based on an irrigation system in place. It's a it's a modest investment. It does, um, you know, I wish I had a metric to share with like a square footage cost, but you know, I'd say an average residential lot between three and five thousand dollar investment for an irrigation system. Um, it doesn't always make sense to set up a temporary irrigation with um, the tripods and hoses and 
and then when you're you know timers and all that it's almost a, you know the same cost wash as just putting a system in and they they do make really smart systems now that are barometer a barometer systems built into them so they can sense when it's going to rain and they won't overwater and that's so it is, um, I know it's a little bit, uh, I mean, the lawn as a practical thing is, is um, very affordable ground cover <laughs> into itself. And if you want that to feel lush and look beautiful, then water is, is, is a factor. So it's either hand watering or an irrigation system. And like, as I said before, you can tap into water catchment uh, cisterns um, to make it more uh, water, sustainably harvested water um, system. <laughs> And yeah, not, there's not run up the water bill. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nothing more um, uh, hard to see than someone's irrigation system going on when it's raining outside. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the barometer system sounds like a, a, a great um, thing to invest in. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We have. Um, and, and I guess, you know, to, to talk about uh, environmental extremes, um, there's a comment and a question, what are some environmental challenges faced by New England gardeners? Hmm. Um, <coughs> New England gardeners, um, uh, I would say sort of the um, pests are one of them. Um, we're getting <coughs> more pests as the climate gets warmer. Um, and we're getting more invasive plants too that are sort of starting to outcompete and also um, disperse seeds. So from basically like a maintenance perspective, that's that can be a challenge when you're getting Norway maples blowing into weed beds and garden beds and barberry and, and other things. But um, I think climate unpredictability is, is maybe the biggest thing and um, that gets back to water needs. So how do you plan a garden and anticipate water needs? Um, those are, I think the garden um, is a, you know, uh, each garden typology is, is, is maybe specific, has specific water needs, veggie garden versus flower garden versus, you know, perennial garden versus woodland garden. So it, maybe it's a, a bigger, bigger topic, but I think the swings in, in temperature and, uh, and rainfall are pretty key to all of those. So um, I think that's, uh, where I would um, see the biggest challenges um, so far. And, and gardens are, you know, a wonderful pastime and aesthetic, uh, add aesthetic value to, to a house. Um, uh, take, they, do, they do, do take a lot of focus and uh, attention though. Um, and yeah. yeah, perennial gardens in particular, I love planting perennial gardens and letting them establish and sort of self creating ones that can self-maintain too, because I know maintenance more and more is <clears throat> maybe less people's uh, interest as we live our busier lives. And um, and that's one thing we try to specialize in is creating a, a foundation and kind of creating borders and edges of places that have robust plantings and feel beautiful, but don't need deadheading and every, everyday weeding sort of conditions. Um, um, it's maybe changing the aesthetic a little bit or expectations <laughs> of what you expect. But um, yeah, they're, uh, the nursery trade, I think, is really, um, you know, if, if planning for gardens, uh, one of the challenges would be to find locally sourced plants. I don't know if that sort of tiptoes into that question as well, but a lot of times we'll see perennials arriving way from way out of state, you know, grown in. New Jersey or Ohio or um, North Carolina. And so to, to track down regionally or, you know, locally produced and grown plants um, is one of the challenges just because of the commercial swings of industry. But that really, to me, you get an, an adapted plant right from the get go that, uh, you know, hasn't traveled several hundred miles and is suited, suited directly for your climate. It's going to adapt a lot more quickly. That's great. Um, we have another uh, question about, uh, and I think you you said this earlier in your talk um, regarding the sloped sloped sites, um, mm -hmm. and our terrace is a good option. I'm sorry, our tiering tiering. Uh, sorry, our terraces. Oh, terraces. <laughs> yeah, terraces are a great option. Um, 
they um, can be used as sort of space making um, dividers to kind of help transition from one grade to the next. They they can become usable spaces uh, depending on the scale and size of them, as in sort of an interstitial space of you can and have they can just be materially. You know how you how do you construct that uh, is is really based on budget and uh, available resources and materials. But you, they could be you know as simple as stacking stone and backfilling and retaining and and adding a few steps to you know terrace around or um, more of a constructed stone wall um, or important place concrete wall or we've done steel walls or tin walls. Um, it really I think is. Uh, a great way to um i think what i what i try to you know appeal to aesthetically is to have it not feel forced not like the like a not like a dot wall <laughs> it's my biggest <laughs> gripe um so that uh there's just a level of craftsmanship and intentionality to it however it's built um so i guess that's I decided to throw an image up of Soren so we can oh, see who's geez, see thanks. so we can see who's actually speaking here. <laughs> I'm actually I'm wearing that hat. If it's no okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Uh, no. Do you have a couple more, Audrey? Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, back. Um, yep. We just got one in from Elizabeth. Uh, we plan to have a fence that will keep our dog in and keep deer away from our vegetable gardens. Do you have any thoughts about a fence design that would be effective? That's mm. a very good question. Yeah, great question, because fence is really part of the architectural language. And um, so material choices are, are key and you know that gets back to budget. But uh, I think deer usually are not dissuaded by a four foot fence. You know, six foot is really kind of gonna give you more of a an aggressive uh, barrier to the deer, but four feet seems more palatable to a dog fence, but I think you might have to find the sweet spot. Um, <clears throat> I think where you engage with the fence and see it and touch it on a regular basis, it might have the ability, you know, to feel maybe um, more uh, designed um, as, an, as something aesthetic that you would engage with every day. But if there's parts of it, you know, because costs, fence costs can go high pretty quickly. So if you if you have the ability to wrap a property or put it in towards the edges uh, in planting beds, you can. A lot of times we'll just use um, like a six by six cedar post with uh, galvanized steel wire mesh, like a you know a two by two uh, opening and a cedar cap or some sort of top. It doesn't even actually need a cap in that case. And, um, I think the spacing, you know, post spacing between six and eight feet makes sense. Um, that's sort of a, a cost effective way of getting a lot of coverage. And you can actually go taller with that fence if you wanted to do like a six foot fence, the same, same strategy. Um, and you could step down to four if, if that was suitable. But um, yeah, the, uh, you know, that also, the mesh kind of goes away with the shadow line, so you're not, it doesn't become a central visible feature if it's sort of a peripheral and more functional fence to kind of just keep the deer and out and the, the dog in um, versus just a, a you know, highly aesthetically pleasing fence, uh, which to me is almost like a piece of furniture. I think about that when you're, you're designing the gate or the areas that you're gonna be seeing regularly, so. Um, but, uh, you know, taking cues from the architecture, um, I'm looking at some of the, the different units on on the website and you know using a natural wood that would weather to gray um, that might match some of the architectural de details of the house um, some of the, the shade screens or fenestration um, local cedar i i've been promoting more locust um, fencing as a it's actually a really old material it's a it's considered a weed tree but it's there are sources you can get it um, for so if you didn't want to go to a cedar or another or composite post, but um, that's a good alternative and, see, and has a really long anti rot property, long, longevity, long lived posts. And they also make it as a board for infill if you wanted to use a 
locus. Sorry, um, sorry, can you repeat that? What did you say, yeah. locus? Locus, black locus is a, um, it's actually considered an invasive tree and it's the reason why it hasn't been harvested because it's, you know, there's just not a lot of loggers or woodcutters that are encountering that in like a forest situation. It's more like what you'll see along roadsides and, you know, edges of fields. Um, but there's been a couple mills that have been seeking it out. There's one in Vermont that we use um, in Putney, Vermont, that they, they cut and harvest posts as well as decking and, and siding and uh, slatting for, for fences. It has really long, instead of using like a tropical hardwood, um, like Ipe or mahogany that has those qualities as well. So you're you're suggesting planting them um, as as a fencing? Oh oh no, I was saying you yeah, you certainly could. You'd have to wait a little while, um, but oh, the, uh, oh. you could uh, uh, you know look at using a, a locally harvested rot resistant wood like a, a locust. Oh, yep, gotcha. Versus a cedar or something like that. Yeah. I see. Um, how about natural fencing? How about you know just a buffer of trees? Um, yeah. yeah. What what would be quick growing, but nothing too like all of a sudden it's out of control. <laughs> uh, um, for like a dense edge, like a visual barrier, or yeah, mm -hmm. for a visual yeah. barrier. <clears throat> um, I like to layer plantings sometimes, so it doesn't feel too sort of standoffish. Or but if you have a tight space and you need a quick growing evergreen type plant, you know, eastern white cedar does does quite well um you know people have plants are everybody's got opinions about specific plants so I, um i i think that uh you know that's that's sort of an aesthetic it crosses over the aesthetic there's probably three or four options that could work well with that but there's one called um a techni uh, eastern white cedar and uh, i use hemlock hemlock quite a bit although that's getting um predated on by the woolly delgid, so it's, it's unfortunately, you know, a native plant that's being susceptible to a imported pest. Um, but yeah, I think the eastern white cedar does pretty well with with deer and with uh, with uh, it's pretty disease resistant. So I think that's that's probably what I go to. Um, there are I, I kind of like the idea of a thicket in a way like if it's going to be a lower dense hedge then i'll consider um like a bayberry um uh semi evergreen plant and then maybe layer that with some red twig up front so you get the evergreen with the red color interest and pop of the twigs in the front or winterberry holly um similar add some wildlife aspect bringing the birds in the <coughs> uh, in the winter so there's um it's it's really property specific, but there's plants. Uh, you can do so many things with plants. It's sort of the fun, creative, painterly aspect as well as uh, the functional overlay that I really enjoy. Mm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Uh, do you have anything um, to comment or suggest um, for the um, the moths? We've been seeing more and more of. Um, and, I can't remember the name of them. I'm sorry about that, but the, they come out and um, lay their eggs in the canopy. Oh, the brown tail, brown tail moth? Not brown tail moth, the ones that eat the canopy. Um, and uh, <coughs> the temp caterpillars? The caterpillars, yeah. Yeah. Um, I first thought you were saying moss, which I was like, oh, yes, I love moss. I think I did, uh, yeah. Sorry. Moss. Because um, <laughs> we do, do use the moss quite a bit as well um, yeah. in shady sites as a ground cover. Um, but moths, um, I you know usually defer to pest management companies when it comes to moths. There you know there's so many different approaches to either you're open to spraying them or you know removing branches and limbs that are infected. Um, that's sort of a arborist slash. Um, pest control. Um, in fact, I, I don't know if there's really anything to combat them yet. Um, other than, yeah. <laughs> there, there yeah are, you see a lot of the tree bands, you know, the, um, in 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 the fall to inhibit <coughs> inhibit the um, that's true. Yep. 
the yeah. migration of the, I guess it's the caterpillars up into the canopy. Um, yep. So well, there, it's a, uh, <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of hungry critters out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're trying to protect. I think, you know, it's an interesting topic all around from, uh, you know, the, the meadow conversation. I think that in the infiltration of uh, deer ticks and Lyme disease is, is a big topic of how do we protect, you know, kids and dogs and just not bring in the ticks and, um, you know, how do we have a safe, maintained space that we can inhabit? And, um, I think you know those are all all topics to consider. With each one specific to to what plant communities you're promoting on your property. What if someone has ooh, established lawn but would like to make it more meadow like? Mm. Uh, yeah. Do you have suggestions on that? Yeah, we we do that quite often. Um, there's a couple approaches. If there's a time line that has about you know a six month buffer, we often recommend. What's called solarizing, which is essentially putting a light, you know, um, a tarp over the, the lawn or tarps to um, inhibit sun and growth. It basically sterilizes the soil and prevents any any kind of growth of um, weeds that, that we might take in. And then that, that keeps the root system in place, which I think is pretty important for keeping the organic material in in place. Um, and you can either rake that and seed directly into that or plug plant directly into that, but you already have that rich, um, you know, root base and humus to, that is a good starting place for, for a plug planted meadow. Um, if it's gonna be seeded, I sometimes recommend tilling it after it's been solarized. This just prevents having to use an herbicide to kill the grass, um, tilling it, raking it, and then seeding it with the meadow. But uh, it's, it's, um, takes a little bit of effort, but I, I, if you're looking to cut back on the amount of mowing or just, you know, not having as much lawn in general, just uh, I think that's a great choice. Great. Um, let's see, I think we're kind of through our questions now. Um, it looks like we have about 10 minutes left. Um, yeah. Do you have any um, other? I'd just like to call attention to the time and, and let Soren know we appreciate uh, being here today and, and taking his time. One thing that we might want to close on, Soren, and uh, I've been lucky enough to have you as a uh, be a client of yours for one of my homes, so I know the, the process and, and the diligence yeah. that you bring to the table. Maybe you can just um, tell us when a good time to consider a landscape architect is with a new build, perhaps? And then we'll close it out for the day. Yeah, no, that's that's a great um, point, Jay. Um, I think if it's not often considered to to think about um, landscape or architect or designer, you know, right from the beginning, but it's it's probably the most cost effective way to engage, since the soft costs are relatively low on the design side. But what you're ensuring in the beginning is, you know, the correct house placement um so there's less undoing i guess i guess or redoing of things um and you can work with landscape designers on so many different scales you can get a master plan up front like i was mentioning in the beginning um which sort of you know for a reasonable uh, cost you just get a schematic but it, it it's, it's it's a broad thinking that addresses all the topics that we were talking about, grading, plant palette, water use, um, solar gains, even site lighting, materials palette, and you have a general sense of how all those things could fit in and it also helps you budget um, accordingly. So you know you're, you're gonna have to plow for a certain amount to get from point A to point B, but the master plan could be X. So, um, <clears throat> and then, you know, if you wanted to go all the way through using a landscape architect through design development, construction documents, and construction administration, um, that just really ensures that the design vision you had is implemented without any sort of the guesswork, but um, it also can be implemented over, over time. So um, if you do have a home, existing home, and still wanna engage uh, with the architect, there's, there's certainly, in, in to work out specific questions about grade transitions or materials palette or adding a deck or patio, those, um, 
it's never too late, I would say, but um, certainly for planning a new home, um, early, early is best. And we do collaborate quite a bit. I know um, other designers and architects do too, but, um, you know, to consider the site before the house is placed and uh, work, work out, you know, the, all the different interface points between grade changes, front and back house, um, sight lines and windows and view sheds. And, um, anyway, that, that's my pitch, but um, there's, <laughs> there's, uh, I would say that it's, it's a, it can be a really fun process too. And um, it doesn't, it feels like it accounts for all, you know, um, it really rounds out the, the home experiences, the indoor outdoor, to know that, that both those things are being considered with the equal intentions. Definitely agree with that. So I'm gonna tell everyone where they can find you. Uh, <laughs> they have um, yeah, I am okay. in Portland. I'm in Portland, Maine here. Um, but uh, I have a website as Soren at uh, my web email is Soren at SorenDemore.com. So um, those are probably the best bets, or just give me a ring or, you know, ping me through Bright Built folks, and I'm sure we can find a way to connect. But um, yeah, it was a pleasure, you know, sharing these thoughts and ideas. And I'm always happy to uh, even just answer questions. Uh, we should make them up. Uh, as you get going in the process. Awesome, really appreciate your time today, Soren, and everyone else's uh, for making some time today at lunch. Audrey, thanks for doing such a good job on the questions. Everyone have a, a great day and a good weekend. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jay.